So today we're going to remove a timekeeper chip, socket and replace it in a Bimani System 573 on a GX700 board. Typically used for DDR, Dance Maniacs uh, and games even like Silent Scope. So the principles will be the same across those games. And again if you have different PCBs the same principle applies. So how do you know if you have a bad timekeeper chip? Well I'll show you right now. So here's a video of the error in English. Again, you could get it in Japanese. It appears on a lot of Konami systems, 573 systems, uh, including DDR and uh, also Dance Maniacs as well. So you can actually still play the game with a bad timekeeper chip or the battery inside it anyway. You just hit the test button in the coin door, the game will boot as normal and uh, you can carry on playing. The only thing that won't work is high scores and you might notice that the attract sounds tend to play the same songs over and over. Another annoying thing is if you're running an official game you'll have to keep entering the unlock codes every single time. However if you're running a disc like the Super Disc this is already done for you and again the 605 error won't appear when using the Super Disc. It'll just continue to boot. But again, just like the Super Disk and just like official images, you still won't get any high scores persisting on subsequent machine reboots. So coming into the back of the machine, this is the 573, this little silver box right here. We just need to disconnect the jammer harness, and the RCA cables there, and the other cables for lights and things like that. If you have a Japanese cabinet, you might notice the orientation is vertical rather than the Korean cabinet, which is horizontal. If it's a dance maniac, it might look something more like this, but similarly the same kind of principle applies in getting it out. Now the 573 is out of the arcade cabinet, we need to just take it apart so we can remove the board from inside of it. So under normal circumstances, there should be a screw here, here, same on the other side, and also two in the top. That should free the top from the case itself. I've opened mine so many times I've just kind of left them off now. If you have a security cassette, just pop that out. It's a blue cartridge. They're kind of useless now. I'd never buy one used because um, they're like a one-use thing. The serial number gets burnt into it. Uh, but nowadays, um, these aren't really used. We just use kind of custom boot ROMs and things to get around that. So don't be worried if you don't have one of those. Next, eject the PCMCIA card. It's in the top slot, so remember to put that back in there when you're done. Just press the button there, pull it out. So with the security cartridge slot facing away, just pull it to the left and that should unhook it. You'll be able, you'll be able to lift the top and just pull the top like that. Disconnect the Molex connector from the CD-ROM and that will um, allow you to push the flap all the way over. So with the top now just folded over, we can remove the IDE cable for the CD-ROM right here. We can also move, remove the case fan, which is this little one right here. With these, you can just slip a small screwdriver in the hole at the end here, just behind that, and that should allow it to pop out. The Molex, you just uh, pinch the top and you can pull that one out. So now we've removed those three components, we're just going to take out the boot ROM. You don't really need to remove it, but um, it can be in the way, so I, I just recommend removing it. Yours might look like this, it might be a small chip. I'm not going to get into boot ROMs or what they are, but you can slowly pry it out evenly by uh, distributing the pulling power on both sides as to not bend the pins when removing that. Okay, with the boot ROM out of the way, just push it to the side and uh, we can now see the uh, timekeeper chip which is this chip right here so now we're going to disconnect this board here this board takes in uh, the inputs from these uh, adapters right here and they go into this board and ultimately to the main board so you probably have a screw here, one in the corner and also one right here so just undo those standard Phillips head with the screws removed, uh, we can remove this cable right here. This just links the boards together. We're going to remove it at this end. Like the uh, chassis fan here, you just stick a small flathead in this gap here, and that should pry it out. 
from this socket over here. So we're just going to remove this board from the main board. Uh, the screws were removed, the cables were removed. Uh, it's actually held in by a connector that looks just like this. So you can just pry up on it evenly and pull it out of the way. Uh, these RCA connectors here, there's just enough clearance for it to be disconnected and then you can slot it out. Uh, when you do that, you can sort of do a back flip over here with the board and then you can remove the main board without disconnecting any of these harnesses. So here's the back flip, it's all the way over there and I can access the main board quite easily now. There's probably a few screws holding it in but we need to remove these posts first. So with these, let's just make sure um, that the board above it is nice and flat and doesn't sort of bend and warp. So we can remove those three and then we can remove the remaining Phillips heads and we should be able to remove the main board from the case. So with the board removed, we can get to work on this. So inside this timekeeper chip right here, this is the one right here, it lives next to the boot ROM socket. Inside is a small silver battery, uh, kind of like a motherboard battery, one of those uh, CR2032 batteries. What happens is the battery just dies over time. But it's uh, epoxied in, um, and it's almost impossible to get it off. So. Um, what you should really do is install a socket and then get a new chip and install the chip into the socket. That's one way of doing it and that's going to be the easiest way and that's the way I'm going to show you in this video. So when buying replacement timekeeper chips, I recommend buying two from two different sellers because a lot of them are really old stock and they tend to be dead on arrival. So that way when we socket this, we get two chances. Um, at getting this to work without ordering some more of these. So I highly recommend uh, uh, getting a desoldering pump. So in the end here you just uh, put one of the pins in the end. There it is. Put one of the pins in the end here. As it heats up you just push the button here and that sucks the solder into this chamber and then you can eject it by just pushing it back in and that will eject the solder out of the way. This is uh, really useful, I highly recommend using it. You can also use something like this, uh, a soldering iron with uh, some desoldering braid or even a hot air gun. However, I, I sort of don't really recommend that because on here there's very small traces that are very easily damaged if you're not careful and you apply too much heat. So you can see here so it's very easy to um, disrupt one of these traces and your board might be ruined unless you can sort of patch and fix that. So with the desoldering pump, very easy, I've never had a problem doing it so far. Another thing I recommend is getting a tub of flux. It's pretty much just rosin paste. Um, in other words, kind of just like tree sap. <laughs> And that gives you the soldering joints a really strong bond and allows a really good bonding of the solder so you don't kind of get the little flicks of bubbles and dry joints and things. So this I really recommend. And uh, flux core solder, um, it's pretty much standard now but I just thought I'd say that. Don't use plumber's solder or anything weird like that. But for all the tools and parts you might need, I'll link them in the description below, and even the replacement chips and sockets as well. So check that out. So while our soldering pump heats up, I'll, um, I'll give you a couple of tips uh, about this. Have you ever noticed that once the 605 error appears, it just never goes away? It's not like sometimes, it's all or nothing. And that's because when the machine boots up, it does a little check of voltage on the internal battery inside our chip, for reference. And if it's less than around 2.5 volts, it sets a flag on the chip itself. Once that flag is set, there's no really getting rid of it. You can't like reset the flag, maybe with some manual tools or something. But it's just to protect the integrity of the data on the chip. So if it's uh, less voltage, batteries going out, the data is the data integrity isn't that good. So it's recommend you replace the battery, but because the battery is epoxied in, we replace the chip instead. So the iron's almost heated up now. What I recommend is just getting a little bit of flux, just applying it onto one of the pins. I mean this solder is about 20 years old now, if not more. 
just a little flux on there okay and now get your the soldering pump just position it over the wire heat the wire done and that's one done simple as that so go all the way along all the way along the other side and the chip will not budge until all of these joints have gone even if you have just one left that's partially on the chip will not come out don't try and pry it with a flat head you're just going to damage the board or or the old chip or well, the old chip doesn't matter but you don't want to damage the board so it's as simple as that work your way along then use a little magnifying glass just to check the joint is nice and loose you can wiggle the pin a little and then the chip should uh, be removed pretty easily from the uh, just be patient with it if you haven't done it before. Uh, it might be a bit of a ball ache, but you'll get there in the end. So that's sort of what you're aiming for. You see the one with the hole around the pin? That's exactly what it should look like before you kind of move on to the next pin. So we're almost there. I just got to touch up some of the end ones there. But um, yeah, like you can see there, it's not quite through there. And also a couple of those... Uh, so we're nearly there, it's just a bit of trial and error. Um, magnifying glass really helps with it. So I've managed to uh, take the chip out. It's a little stubborn, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to bend this anyway. Uh, next thing we're going to do, we're just going to clean up these holes. So again, we can use the uh, solder vacuum to clean up these holes. And then we're going to socket it. So once you've cleaned out the socket, just hold it up against a window. You'll see the light shine through a lot easier. It looks pretty good to me, so we're going to socket this now. The sockets are just 28 pin, they're the 0.6 inch uh, row space, so they're the wide ones, 2.54 millimeter pitch. I'll link them in the description below, but yeah, that's what you're looking for to uh, socket the timekeeper. So just insert the socket into the holes there, it should press in quite easily. And now we're going to solder it in from the other side. I recommend um, putting the chip in afterwards because we don't want to heat it up more than necessary when we solder this socket in. When installing the socket, make sure all the pins are evenly through the holes. Uh, what can happen is uh, the pins actually go through the plastic and the socket rises above the plastic for, say, one pin. And then you um, solder it in and realize afterwards and you have to kind of correct that and push it back down so it's good just to have a check now once you've done that push up through with your hand and just get a bit of solder on your iron and just spot it on the two opposite corners that'll ensure the socket doesn't fall through as you solder the rest of it in so I'm not going to show you how to solder um, there's plenty of videos on that um, what I do I just put a bit of flux on each peg there and I've got my flux core solder and that's perfectly enough to get a nice good bond with the solder and the pins. And then, yeah, just get your iron on there, put the solder up. And once the solder is on the pin, just use your soldering iron just to dab it a little and that will give you a nice sort of globule, you know, sort of bit of solder on the pin. Just, just like you see from the factory right here. Okay, so we're all soldered in now. Uh, don't worry about the flux. <laughs> you can clean it with some uh, pure strength isopropyl alcohol, and that won't damage any of these circuits. Then, um, so I, I usually just get some of the residue off. So cleaning the flux, unless you have a special type of leave-in flux, I'd recommend removing it. You can use isopropyl alcohol, the pure stuff, 99.99%, and just make sure the kind of flux is off. Uh, if it's not the leaving flux, it can cause corrosion. Um, you know, uh, there's lots of articles on that. I, I've seen experiences where people don't clean it off and it's fine, but I recommend just removing any uh, excess residue. So now we can revel in our nice new socket now. So anytime this chip goes out, we can just remove it and put a new one back in. So that's pretty cool. So put it in the right direction. So uh, these words here sort of are on the same side as this right here so it goes in that way and just careful that all the pins line up and press it in evenly another question if you have a funky boot rom yes it will fit just about a millimeter so don't worry about that 
So now we're going to put it back in the case. Uh, assembly is pretty much the opposite of uh, disassembly, so no problem there. And we're going to boot it up and see if it solved the problem.